Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hey, and welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got Noah Olson back on the show. Noah is a five-time CrossFit Games athlete, and he's placed as high as fourth at the Games. In this show, we talk about what happened at Wadapalooza this year. He did not have his best performance, and he explains everything that went on and how he bounced back. We talk about how he's changed his mindset over the years, why he thinks he has a pattern of making one really big mistake at a lot of events like the games and what his plan is to overcome it. Uh, we talk about how he deals with the pressure from having 500,000 Instagram fans and what it's like to have so much of his personal life kind of on display and up for criticism. We talk about his plans for the rest of the season and we finish with his three biggest pieces of advice for people that want to improve their training. Before we get this show started, guys, if you want to give back to the show, just share this with a friend, hit the subscribe button. That's all you can do. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the show. Noah, welcome back to the show, man. Such a pleasure to be here again. So every now and then I'll get some of our audience to chime in with questions. And we've got a great question to start off the show. This is from at Andrew Shaquin 9 on Instagram. And he okay. wants to know, do you lean or stand while you wipe your ass? Oh, wow. Uh, definitely a leaner. Does anybody stand when they <laughs> when they go to wipe their butt after uh, poop? I think I might every now and then. But sometimes huh. I sit, I sit, and then I'll kind of do a half stand, wipe, and then, re- <laughs> and then reset. I don't know what the, the circumstances are when I switch my technique, but uh, I do like to mix it up. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank you for your little gift of uh, toilet paper with your <laughs> face plastered on it. I haven't, I haven't used it yet, but I'll definitely be uh, leaning when I do. Love it, dude. Yeah. All right, man. So we had Wadapalooza <laughs> one week ago. I think we're one, yeah, one week out. Yeah, just about a week. You posted on your Instagram a few days ago that. It was not my quote unquote best finish, but maybe the best story I've been able to tell yet. Tell us the story. What happened? You know, it, it was interesting because it started off as uh, I was really psyched about it. And, and I can, I'm going to give you a little brief summary, but I'm actually really excited in the next couple of days, I'll be putting out a video on my YouTube channel that's basically a, a little mini documentary of the entire weekend from start to finish. I had a, my media guy, Julian, down here was with me from before the event and then all the way through. And so he was able to document a lot of the emotion, both positive and negative, as I kind of went through that little roller coaster of a weekend. But the reason I said it was kind of my best story is just for me, I feel like it was, uh, I was able to prove a little bit to myself that I have a strong character and that I was able to bounce back from uh, some adversity. And I've dealt with adversity before and sometimes I've been able to overcome it, but I don't know. I just started uh, the first day of the competition off with a pretty terrible performance and was going to have to really, really claw my way out of the hole and to have hoped to be able to pull that off all weekend and then to finally have done so at the end. It's a pretty rewarding. So what exactly happened? Uh, I think you started off with a second place finish in event one. What happened after that? Oh man, I wish it was a second place finish. It was uh it was a 28th place finish on the first event, I believe. And then I was able to take a fifth on the second event and like another something like mid 20s on the third event. So after day 1, I think I was sitting in 19th place, which is Damn. definitely not where you want to be after the a couple events on day 1. What do you think happened? What 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 led to that? You know, I, I've done a little bit of processing, and believe it or not, I, I can kind of relate the first event being a trail run type of workout 
to the games in 2016, I want to say it was, that they took us out to the ranch. And we started with that 7K trail run. And I did the same thing at Wadapalooza that I did there where I went out really hot and was just fired up and excited. It was the first weekend of the competition and I felt good. So I was kind of out leading the pack. And then we got to about the halfway point and I exploded and just had a really hard time physically recovering from that on the first day. It kind of like felt a little bit of that lag with me throughout the next two events. But um, I think hopefully now being able to correlate those two, I can learn from that. And my coach and I were talking about it after that event. And he's like, let's try this. Just next time you're in a, a running race, let's not be winning at the beginning. Let's try to win at the end. <laughs> yes. like, ah, all right, good idea. I'll, I'll, I'll hang back at the start of the race from now on and see if that works. So what were you feeling like that night? What was going through your head? I was pretty bummed out. Um, I, I, in the past, I've been able to sometimes just let it go and feel okay and optimistic about the rest of it. But I think with it being my home crowd and having done so well here in the past, it was just such a disappointing contrast to what I was hoping for and expecting. So I was pretty bummed and I woke up the next morning and still felt kind of overwhelmed with that negative emotion. And luckily, my girlfriend, Joanne, is like a sports psychologist and she doesn't even know it but <laughs> she's been able to talk me out of situations and experiences like that in the past and we just had a really good conversation on the way down Saturday morning and she helped to kind of snap me out of it and get my energy flowing in the right direction to have a, a little bit of a comeback there. Do you remember what she told you by chance? I do yeah we, we had a couple of things and, and that'll be in the video too in, in more depth but she kind of helped me come up with a little mantra that I used a bit throughout the weekend. Just, and it was simply, I'm, or I'm sorry, this is tough, but I'm tougher. And in the times where the workouts were tough or I was feeling down about my placement, I just had to remind myself that I could be better than those circumstances. And that helped me to just kind of make it bigger than the moment. Um, and then she also just made me sing along to some songs in the car mm -hmm. And so it was fake enthusiasm at first, but I don't know if you've ever experienced the whole fake it till you make it thing. Sometimes that fake enthusiasm turns into some real positivity and that just helped get me out of my funk. Certainly, man. That's awesome. So you told yeah. me before the show that this event had a really big impact on you. And I think it probably has something to do with that sense that you have character. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What, why was that such a powerful experience for you? I kind of decided after the first day, like I was pretty down and out, you know, I, I it felt like at that point, probably not going to be able to win the competition. There were only four more events left to go. I was in 19th place. I had been hoping to win again and get a qualifying spot to the games. And with that kind of being off the table, there was part of my mind that wanted to just give up and quit and say, all right, well, just kind of write it off. The weekend's over. You're not going to be able to achieve your goal. Why continue to put passion and effort and energy into it? And then there was a, a greater part of me that wanted to fight against that little voice and say, no, don't, don't do that. Don't be a quitter. Don't be a, a any, any list of bad names that you could call somebody like that. And I wanted to prove to myself that I could push through those thoughts and feelings and give it everything that I had, even if it didn't necessarily quote unquote matter um, in terms of reaching that goal. I had to kind of create a new goal in the moment. And for me, that was just to show myself and other people that I had character and that I could bounce back after some negativity. Yeah. I think that's really powerful, man. Not only for your belief in yourself, but how you know this this term how you do everything anything is how you do everything is super popular right now and that is such a great example of that i think a lot of people would would choose the easy route out right they're not going to qualify for the games and so they just kind of give up because there's not really any reason at that point uh not any direct reason to try but if you would have given up in that moment what's to stop you from giving up when you actually do make it to the games and you experience adversity, right? It's, oh, the, man, same, sure. it's the same muscle in your mind that, that you just strengthened by continuing to try hard at that event. 
Totally. Yeah. I feel like that could be a snowball effect where if you open that door of, of quitting and giving up on yourself once, then it could just kind of be like everything can flood in and, and it can be a lot easier to do so in the future. So I'm glad that I didn't go that route. Um, would have been even more glad if I hadn't had to deal with the situation <laughs> in the first place, but sure. Hey, it's, it's all good. It happens. And I, I feel like I came out of it as victorious as I could have been given the circumstances. And it sounds like it was a really big opportunity for you to learn. You know, if next time at the games you have a running event and you approach it differently, then this event here, failing at this event or just not having your best performance was actually a blessing, right? It was actually moving you forward in your in your training and your development. Totally, man. That, that kind of made me think of the quote, you either win or you learn. Exactly. There's no just losing. So I didn't win, so I'm going to learn from it. So you're now one of the veterans at the games. You have multiple top 10 finishes and people really expect you not only to be at the top, but to be competing and getting on the podium. What effect does that have on, your, on you in terms of uh, feeling pressure, whether it be positive or negative? <laughs> that puts a funny little smile on my face to think of myself as a veteran. I guess I am at this point, but it's crazy to think that it's been five years that I've been competing at the games and that I, I still feel like I'm just brand new to this whole thing. Sometimes I don't, sometimes I do, but it doesn't feel like I have been in it forever, even though I think that you're right that some people do see it that way. Um, I don't know that that puts a lot of pressure on me, my like expectation from other people. I think that I tend to kind of put that expectation on myself mm -hmm. and I, I tell myself, all right, you've been here before. You've tried to achieve this goal over and over and over and you're not giving up. But is it like, is this going to be the year if you're trying to make it? All right. It didn't happen last year. Is it going to happen this year? You know, um, what, I think that I, it? what is it? Yeah, that's a great question as well. I think it is very simply winning the games, but that's not so simple when you think about it. It's a simple thing to think about and to set as a goal just because it's easy to say, I want to be the best and I want to win this competition. Um, I've had to adjust that goal a little bit as I've gone just so that I don't always end up super disappointed. There are always these little micro goals. And then I've had to consider the last couple of years, well, do I want to alleviate a little bit of that self um onset of pressure by saying, all right, I, I don't necessarily go into the games thinking I need to win, but I, I really want to get on the podium. Like that's a, a sub goal to winning the games. And that would make me feel satisfied. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I, I've played with that idea and, and I would definitely be satisfied to some extent if I am able to make the podium at the CrossFit games, that would be a, a bit of a lifetime goal for me. But I think it would still always be bittersweet. I, I've always said that I wanted to win the CrossFit Games and I don't want to give up on that. It's just, it does get tough. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. If you've been trying to do one thing for five years and over and over annually, you get this reminder that you didn't achieve that goal. It's hard to keep striving for it, but I'm not giving up just yet. So we'll see how it all pans out. So you and the rest of the athletes at the Games went from being just people doing wads in the local gym like most of the people listening to this show right now to semi-famous people on on instagram and other social media platforms with like literally hundreds of thousands of people following everything that you do how has this affected you personally and professionally it's pretty cool to be honest i've I've really enjoyed the process and I think I'm figuring out how to navigate it even better and make sure that I have a decent amount of balance in my life to where I have some type of an intimate personal life with my girlfriend and my family. And then also I'm able to kind of be open and honest and share things with my fan base and create a relationship with them too. So um, I think it's not just this, like they're seeing me through the TV screen and I'm up on the pedestal and they only get this outside view. I want to, I want to connect with people and make them feel like it is a two way street and mm -hmm. that we have, do have a relationship that's not just one sided. So trying to do that more and more by just providing more content and being more open and honest and giving people an insight to my life outside of the gym, which 
I've kind of done a little bit more on my YouTube channel with my friend who is helping me with all of my media stuff. Um, but yeah, all in all, I'm, I'm enjoying the process and hoping that I'm navigating it well. I'm sure that there's more and better ways to do what I'm doing, and I'm always open to feedback on that stuff. So we'll see where that road continues to lead as the platform grows. How does it feel to have so much of your private life kind of on display and up for criticism from people? It's tough, or I guess I should say it was tough. I definitely had a hard time with it at the beginning and was very sensitive to the feedback that I would get from people. It seems like it's made a bit of a transition over the years where it's been a lot less criticism and a lot more support from people. And I don't know what it is that I've done. Um, I don't know if I've grown and changed a little bit as a person, just where I feel like now people are able to relate to me on, uh, I don't know if it's a higher level or just a better level where they really kind of um, just give me a lot of love and support. And I feel like in general, the community and, and the, the good and the bad that I've gone through have been able to share really positive um, experiences with most of my fans and followers. Gotcha. So something that I've dealt with and I know a ton of people deal with is on social media, it's so easy to just compare yourself to others because what you see on people's pages are literally the, for, for the most part, you see literally the best moment of their day. And a lot right. of times people are using filters. They are in some ways making their life, lives seem better than they actually are. Uh, and I personally have dealt with some, uh, I don't know, just leaving leaving Instagram, say, feeling mm -hmm. a little bit worse about myself because I'll see uh, competitors and people I look up to and I just, the story in my head is like, I'm not as good as them or, or I'm not good enough. Do you deal with that at all? Yeah, but I think that if you can use it as a source of inspiration rather than uh, negative comparison, I think that that can be one way to kind of twist it around. And I, it's, it's a silly story, but the first thing that came to mind, I was recently scrolling through and a friend of mine, Chandler Smith, not sure if you're familiar with him, but oh, yeah. he posted a photo and he just looked jacked and shredded. And I said to my girlfriend, I was like, babe, I want to be as jacked as Chandler. Like, I'm going to clean up my diet and I'm going to start adding in some freaking little bit of bodybuilding accessory after my workouts because I want to look like Chandler. And it just got me fired up. And uh, I, I don't know. I, that's not always the case. Like sometimes you definitely do see somebody hit a lift that you just failed the day before. And that can be a little frustrating. But I think for the most part, I try to use it like most people do, like go on for a source of inspiration and um, just let that stuff get you fired up in a positive way. Yeah, I really love that approach. And I think it I, I just think it can be hard because there are millions of dollars being spent at these companies to make to make the platform addictive. And it, it's almost like it's made to play the comparison game. How have you how have you made that switch in your mind? Uh, man, that's a good question. I, I don't know. I can't think of specifically when I was able to make that mental shift. I think just in general, the last couple of years, I've tried to really, really just turn everything in my life into and put a little bit of a positive spin on it. So even if there is something negative, try to see the silver lining in it. And I know that can sound kind of like bogus or be hard to relate to, but I, I really do try to incorporate that into everything because I feel like you can find a little bit of a positive in every situation. So um, I, I think there are definitely times that I can think of in the past where I would watch some stuff and be like, damn, I'm not good enough. That guy's way stronger than me. I'm not going to be able to lift that much. And in the the new state of mind, I, I might think that immediately, but then I'll think, all right, but yeah, I, I worked on this today and my running is a little bit better than that guy. And I guess I am playing the comparison game, but in a way that helps to uplift me and encourage me rather than bring me down. Yeah, I think it's literally all about what you choose to focus on. We can choose to focus on the ways that we are weak or we can choose to focus on what we do have and what we do have to bring to the table. I like that. Totally, yeah. So 
you didn't qualify out of Wadapalooza. What does this mean for the rest of your season? Are you going to do more sanctionals or rely on the Open? Unfortunately, I did not qualify from Wadapalooza, and that was kind of my first plan, my, my plan A, you could say. My plan B was the Open. I hadn't thought much beyond that. I didn't want to start getting into the C, D, and E of it. But I think as of right now, I have performed relatively well in the Open the last few years, so I'm kind of banking on that. And then if need be, then I'll try to get myself in on some of these other sanctioned events and uh, make it happen in that way. From your perspective as an athlete, how do, how do you feel your competitors are feeling about the CrossFit Games as a whole, um, especially with all of this uncertainty? Wadapalooza was actually the first time that I've got to interact with a lot of those guys and hear some of their feedback in person. So it was interesting to hear what people said. Um, uh, it seems like most people that were honest about it were pretty shaken up by the whole thing. Like I have admitted myself that it threw me for a loop when it was first announced, but you just got to roll with the punches. And I think a lot of the other guys kind of feel the same way. They're like, well, I don't love it, but we kind of still haven't been painted the full picture. So we'll have to see how it goes. And in the meantime, just do whatever we can to continue to thrive in the environment and the way that the sport is kind of taking shape. Right. So how, do, how at all, how, if at all, does this fuck with your training? Like now, rather than knowing exactly when you need to be at peak out, uh, power output, there is a lot of uncertainty and you might have to be at that level several times a year until you qualify. How are y'all handling that uncertainty? Yeah. I mean, it definitely would have been nice to have qualified in January. I feel like you could kind of breathe easy, take a little bit of a break, focus on some other stuff for a while and then ramp things up closer to the games. With that not being the case, I think it is beneficial to try to qualify as early as possible so that you do have a little bit of that recovery period and time to kind of plan out the rest of your year. It's uh, it won't be great if anybody, myself included, has to qualify very very soon before the games and turn around quickly and perform again there. I mean, who knows? Maybe you can kind of just stay in that peak for whatever period of time that would be. If you qualify a month before the games, maybe just ride that wave and see if you can perform as well as possible through that. But I think ideally I'll be able to qualify out of the open do kind of what I would usually do after that period of time anyways, is kind of rest, taper down a little bit. Um, wouldn't necessarily have to plan any more peaks until August at the games. Maybe you do a couple of little tune-up competitions. I was possibly going to do the Rogue out in Ohio in May. I was right around when regionals was anyway. So you can kind of simulate the old structure of the season if you want to by doing the Open, doing another competition in May, and then hopefully having qualified for the games in August. I think that would be as close to what we're used to as you could get it. So at this point, it sounds like your training is probably pretty unfazed. Are you training just as always? Yeah, it hasn't changed much, you know, because in the past I have done Wadapalooza in January, so I did a little mini peak for that, kind of tapered down afterwards, ramped back up for the Open, and uh, and I think it's going to be the same all the way through that point. The only thing that would be different is that we don't have regionals now, so if I can – earn my spot in March through the open, I can decide whether or not I want to kind of take some time off there and really make sure I'm good to go for the games rather than wasting any energy. If you want to look at it that way in another competition in May. So we've, we've talked about this before and you've acknowledged that you used to be a self-conscious and kind of nervous uh, athlete and nervous about what people thought of you specifically. So where are you at, where are you at with all of that? Where's your head at? I yeah, I'm not sure if I've changed over the years, like I was mentioning earlier, but I definitely just feel like I know who I am now and I feel really comfortable with the person that I am and and who I'm becoming and kind of the path that I'm on. And things are just a little bit more clear in my mind as to what's important in life to me and to many other people and how to be a good person and how much that matters. Whereas before it was kind of more about being cool and, and looking a certain way and feeling tough and strong and kind of, I guess more of that comparison game that we were talking about earlier, but now 
I'm not as worried about that and I can just kind of be who I am, no holds barred and hope that people are going to love me for who I am, but not really worry about it if they don't. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's all it is. Just being comfortable in my skin and being nice to people. And, uh, most of the time I think you're going to get that back. So I know for myself, and I think this is the case for most people in order to develop that sense of comfort in one's own skin, we have to go through some like defining moments. We have to go through some adversity usually, uh, or we just totally. have to, we have to intentionally work at discovering quote unquote who we are. So what's been one or two of those defining moments for you? Like, how did you actually do that? I don't know if I can pinpoint exactly when these shining moments have happened that have changed me, but I would have to imagine that throughout the years of being on this journey, just through CrossFit itself, that I've been working hard toward a goal and kind of having a lot of ups and downs through that journey and getting to meet a lot of new people through that and realizing and recognizing that no matter what my placement is on the leaderboard, that people still love me and that my fan base and my family are still going to support me. And sometimes almost even more so than if I were to win, you know, it's obviously a little bit more fun to celebrate those victories with your family, but you feel almost even more love and support from them when it doesn't go the way that you want it to. And, and if uh, there are some things in your character that show throughout the competition that people appreciate even more than the victories. I know right. last year there were a couple moments where just naturally I was either cheering somebody on um, during one of the workouts or there were, there were just these small moments that I was not doing intentionally that people seemed to recognize and pull out and uh, kind of gave me praise for. And that made me realize that people care more about your person and character and um, empathy and kindness than they do about you just kicking ass and not doing much else. Right. Yeah. What you said about like basically anytime we celebrate with those around us, it's really exciting and fun and it's a great experience. But when we are down, when we're vulnerable and people show up in our corner, that is just so, so much more meaningful. And you've always been successful at every CrossFit Games you've been at. And there have been a couple times where people expected you to do even better. And I know that you put a lot of pressure on yourself to do even better. So when that didn't happen, there was an opportunity for those around you to either show up or not. And it sounds like they really did. Yeah, they always have. And it's funny to hear you say that I've been successful and maybe I need to learn how to reframe that a little bit <laughs> myself. But I, I don't consider that I've had a successful games yet. I mean, the best that I've done is fourth place. And that was kind of bittersweet and not successful because I didn't, I still haven't reached that goal. You know, I still have not stepped up on that podium and mm -hmm. gotten a medal at the CrossFit Games. So it's yet to have been a, a full, complete success for me, but there are definitely a lot of successes along the way. I wonder if this is at play at all. So from my perspective, over the last few years, it seems like you have a pattern of making one or, or maybe more, usually just one, really big mistake at some point that is in <laughs> no, no way related to your fitness, right? It's just, a, it's just some kind of freak error or, or mental lapse. So there was the rope climb workout uh, two years ago. There was the wheelbarrow, uh, wheelbarrow event. There was Wadapalooza just recently. What do you think mm -hmm. that's about? Are you, do you think you're afraid of leading? Are you afraid of succeeding at all? I don't know. I, I don't think so. I, I can't imagine so because in the times that I have won events like Wadapalooza and other things, regionals in the past, it's, I really do thrive in that. And I feel like I can like really engage with that success and harness that, that power and that feeling. But for whatever reason, yeah, I mean, you're right. There kind of always has been a little something that has happened to me. Um, my pedal popping off of the games this year. And, and like you said, the wheelbarrow and making the mistake on the, the run at the ranch. And I don't know. I, I don't know how I get rid of those. And I definitely don't want to be known as that guy, you know, like the guy that always almost made it, but was held back by this one little thing. So 
Uh, I don't know if it's a matter of just keeping my fingers crossed and praying that that doesn't happen or if there is some action that I can take to ensure that those don't occur in the future. Is it possible that at events like Wadapalooza, you feel more confident in yourself than at the games? So at the games, it's all of the best of the best. Of the best. At Wadapalooza or regionals, um, you might feel like you are you're already the best. Do you feel like you might at the games put more pressure on yourself? Like I have to dominate this event leading to some kind of mental error. That's totally possible for sure. I know that in some of those events, because I have had success in the past, I think I tend to reflect on that and help that kind of build me up and and give me confidence. So at the games, you know, I haven't had, those super positive experiences yet where I can go back and say, oh, well, I crushed it in this year and I can do that again. Whereas I have been able to win Wadapalooza so I can reflect on that and be like, all right, I know what it's like to do well here. I know what I have to do and vice versa at regionals say like the Southeast and the Atlantic, that's my region. Like I, I perform well and everybody knows it and I need to show up and do what I'm capable of there. So I don't know if it takes going to take that one breakthrough time at the games for me to give myself that confidence and allow myself to succeed, but I think that that's definitely possible. It's a good point. So what did you learn after last year's games, and what's the biggest thing you've changed as a result? Um, I don't know that there was a major training lesson after last year's games. I feel like I was physically very prepared and – I feel like my fitness was there and I worked on a lot of the things that I needed to that year. Um, I think that, yeah, there were a couple mistakes that were in and out of my control. Um, and I think just being able to, it's, it's, man, it's just a matter of capitalizing. I think like it, it's just in the moment type of stuff. Like I had some events that were so close to being these amazing event wins, like the, the bar muscle up snatch workout, I almost won that one. And then the handstand walk, I almost won that one. And they were so close. And yes, so far, you know, that cliche saying, but um, I think whatever it is, I need to learn to finish and to really capitalize on those moments because sometimes that's just enough to get you over the edge and get up onto the podium. So it sounds like, and you've already talked about this a little bit, but it sounds like you've had some really big realizations when it comes to the leaderboard and how people perceive you. Can you talk about that a little more? Yeah. Um, I think that there was kind of the, the expectation from myself and maybe from other people over the years. And as I have not necessarily reached those expectations for myself, um, I don't know. I think that I I just have had some moments at the games, like I mentioned, where I think that uh, positive experiences and interactions with other people, like there was this one moment at the games this year and, and I don't even know why it happened, but I was walking off the floor and I was giving uh, a couple of people like high fives and taking some photos. And there was a group of people that started chanting my name and it was just kind of like this slow, no, what? No, and it built up and there were like, I don't know, it felt like there were hundreds of people chanting my name and it was just this surreal moment and I I was very in tune with it and I was like, wow, what is happening right now? And I kind of like eyes and tilted my head back out to the side and soaked it all in. And I think just having those experiences with such a large group of people and feeling so loved really helps to make you feel a little bit more secure in who you are and what you're doing and that your journey and what, um, it, that is not all just defined by the number and the placement. That's awesome, man. Where, yeah. it, h- how much of that is related to your motivation to keep training so hard and where else does your motivation come from? Yeah, that definitely is a big part of it, man. People, people in general have become a, a big part of, why I want to train hard and why I want to be able to inspire people and kind of give them hope and just provide some type of positivity for people on, like we talked about earlier, that whole social media world. I think it is 
we kind of talked more about the negative side of it, but I think it can be a really powerful tool to inspire people and to help them make some serious positive changes in their life. So if I can do that in any way, then I think that's amazing. And I want to be able to continue to build my platform to do so with that. And I think that there are probably even more ways out there that I'll be able to have a bigger impact that I haven't figured out yet. And I'm kind of brainstorming every day on what that may be. For now, the priority is training. And I think that winning tends to always broaden your platform. So I think right now, if I can just continue to perform well, then that will allow me to do bigger and better things for people and in the name of love and positivity in the future. In the name of love. So, yeah, buddy. Before we get out of here, uh, what what's your biggest recommendation for fans listening that want to improve their performance? Uh, maybe they are they want to qualify for a sanctional. They want to win a sanctional. What are, what are your recommendations for them? <clears throat> I think there are so many things over the years that have really helped me become, I guess, what you could call successful in the sport of CrossFit. And more than anything, I think just being fully committed to it, like being passionate about it and really, really wanting it and having it not define who you are, but become a big part of your life and succumbing to that and allowing it to to be a passion of yours. I think some people get held back because they maybe think that oh, I'm dedicating a lot of time to this and I'm never going to make it and they feel really torn. And I think I just, I didn't have those second thoughts. I really dove in and gave it everything that I had and continue to do so. So I think that if you can really dive into it and learn to love it and give it all of you, then that's really helpful. Um, I think something that's maybe a little bit more tangible is having some training partners. And that's something that I've realized more recently. And I'm sure everybody has talked about that. There's nothing new, but the importance of that was just reminded to me when I lived in Atlanta for a year and got to train with Travis Mayer and some of those other guys at Training Think Tank was amazing. And in the moment, I didn't realize it, but the old, you don't know what you got till it's gone thing hit me when I moved back to Miami and was back at peak. And I loved that, that gym and the environment and the family atmosphere that we have. But there are not any other games level athletes there that I was able to train with. And it really hit me hard and made me realize, man, it's hard to realize how much you need to push and how good you have to be and what level you need to train at to be successful at some of these competitions. If you don't have somebody like that training with you and pushing you. So I think finding that if you can, if you have that resource available to you is huge. Those are two of the absolute best pieces of advice. Uh, I was, I, I made another uh, run at regionals a couple of years ago and I was training with a team and we, there was, there were two teams at our gym and we would destroy the B team every day. And so we thought <laughs> we were the shit, man. Yeah. We thought we were going to go to regionals and just mop the floor. Clean and house. we got there and parts of it were just an absolute mess. And it was because we had this very one-sided view. We had a, we, we had a, incomplete perspective on it's like a how we were going to perform. Exactly. Exactly. So you need your ego to be beaten sometimes. You need to have an accurate measure of what you're up against. I mean, you look at all of the people that have gone through Cookville to train with Rich. You had Dan Bailey, you had James Hobart, and he raised their level to such a big extent. He's even got his teammate now. I, I'm not sure what his name is, but <clears throat> he was... He was a, a relatively a nobody. And this last year, I think he placed like top 20 in the open. Oh, yeah. Know, just, is it Dre? Dre Strom, I think. It, it, may, it may be. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. <clears throat> but having having a training partner that is better at you at certain in certain areas uh, is extremely beneficial. And to your point about commitment, that one seems really like woo-woo. But I don't want people to gloss over that. Because most people think if I have the right goal or if I'm doing something I'm passionate about, I should always feel motivated, right? I should always feel like I want to be in the gym. And that's just not the case. For high-performing athletes or people in other disciplines, you have to be able to show up and give 100% 
regardless of motivation. I mean, if you're lacking motivation for a really long period of time, then that might be a sign that you're either overtrained or you're doing the wrong thing for yourself. But you have to be committed to your goals if you want to be truly great at something. Amen, brother. I couldn't agree more. What's the biggest mistake you see people making in their training? Ooh, that's a tough one. I think it could almost, the first thing that comes to mind is that it could almost be um, like what we just talked about, but turned into a negative, like where people are maybe over committed and end up kind of doing the over training thing. So I know mm. that that's hard because I just juxtaposed so greatly. One thing that we've said is really important and then said that it could almost be a bad thing. But I think that there are some people that kind of take it overboard and get, I don't know if, I don't think over committed is the word, but they just do too much and they mm -hmm. think that they need to be so all about it. And I think it takes a little while to find the balance and find what training style and level and duration is appropriate for you. But I think that some people do caught up, get caught up in like the more is better thing and just like live their lives in the gym and then can turn it into this situation where they were super fired up and motivated and it was everything to them and they were fully committed, mm -hmm. but they just kind of burned themselves out physically and uh, like mentally and emotionally and motivationally and can just get more frustrated at the whole process than anything. If all that time that they dedicated to it doesn't get them to where they need to be. So 100%. I think even, even though it's hard to do, I think finding that balance is, is crucial hundred percent, man. And Noah, how did those people usually perform on game day? Those people that put so much pressure on themselves in training? Yeah, I think the easy, obvious answer is that that can just kind of all collapse in on them and end up being a, a little bit too much to handle and the pressure kind of makes them crack, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forget. I think it was the creator of Dilbert, one of the most famous cartoons ever. And it just a crazy successful guy he's he he's big on having mult like on high performing individuals having multiple buckets to pull from right if all we care about is one thing when that one thing is stretched or challenged and we don't have other buckets to pull from right if it's an athlete if you don't have some sense of uh strength personally or strength in your relationships or an, an outside hobby of some sort, uh, it can be, it can just immediately lead to you putting too much pressure on yourself, which just doesn't allow you to perform optimally. If you're putting too much pressure on yourself, then on game day, you just cannot perform optimally. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. That's totally true. I, I, as much as I am committed to my training and try to make sure that that's the priority, I definitely try to have other things outside of my life that are uh, part of who I am and, and give me a little bit of a release from the training environment in the gym. Amen, brother. Well, that's it, dude. Where can people keep up with you on social media? Man, all over the place. The the gram is probably the number one at Noah Olson or what am I talking about? It's at Nolson, N-O-H-L-S-E-N, not the full name. Um, and then on my YouTube channel that I was mentioning earlier, that is a platform that I'm diving into a little bit deeper this year. So hopefully everybody's enjoying the content on there and NoahOlson.com. And man, if you guys are ever in the Miami area, come stop in at Peak 360 and get a little workout in with me. Let's go. Dude, thank you so much and good luck this season. My pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Hey guys, over the past five to 10 years, there's been a huge explosion in the number of options in training programs for the sport of fitness. And because there are so many options, it can be really confusing picking the best one for you. So a couple years ago, I created a guide to specifically to help you pick the right training program to meet your needs and to fit your lifestyle. Uh, in this guide, I go over how to avoid the biggest programming mistake that I see people making, five costly misconceptions about program pr programming, training methods that work best, 
three mistakes to avoid when choosing a training program, the importance of value and price, and then finally, four steps to reaching your potential. And this is a free guide. This is something specifically just to help you find what's best for you. And you can get this by going to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash P-Y-P. That's brutestrengthtraining.com backslash P-Y-P. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.